Testing for COVID-19 is a complex subject. There are many tests out there and parsing them apart is confusing. So in this video, we're gonna go over the three different groups of tests currently being used for COVID-19 and we'll explore the strengths and weaknesses of each category of test. A fuller understanding of how these tests actually work and their central points of failure will clear up a lot of confusion and misunderstanding. The vast majority of these tests and the type you keep seeing on the news are ones that attempt to detect SARS-CoV-2 virus by looking for its genetic material. For almost two decades now, we've had the ability to take a strand of DNA and multiply it into billions of copies so that it can then be detected or studied easily. This is the same technique that's used in forensic DNA investigations and we've become pretty good at being able to do this. Now, in case of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, the genetic material is not actually DNA, but a strand of RNA. So before this method can be applied, the DNA first has to be converted into an RNA strand using an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. Once we've created a DNA from a viral RNA, another enzyme called polymerase is used to make a copy. So from one DNA strand, we now have two and the polymerase then works on these two copies, turning them into four, and then that four into 16, into 256, so on and so forth, and essentially what is a chain reaction dynamic leading to billions of copies. Now this technique is known as polymerase chain reaction, or PCR. And because we had to use reverse transcriptase at first, it's actually called reverse transcriptase PCR, or RT-PCR, although most often you'll hear it just called a PCR test. Now, as you can imagine, many PCR tests using many different PCR machines have been developed over the last few months and they all have different performance characteristics. Some of them can complete a few dozen tests a day while others can do a few thousand tests a day. It all depends on the manufacturer. As far as the turnaround time goes, that is also highly variable. A lot of these machines can return a test in an hour or two but others can take as long as eight hours. Now I mentioned this last point because many people have started thinking about these COVID tests as rapid tests or slow tests. Is this a rapid test or not, they will ask. The answer is that the PCR tests are not the rapid tests that you've been hearing about. Now, even though some of these machines can return a result within an hour, and even though an hour isn't slow by any means, the main limitation to getting the test back is in the speed of the PCR machine, but two other factors entirely. The first is getting the sample to the machine. Now these PCR machines are large and expensive. They're housed in laboratories, large clinics and hospitals. You can't just carry them around with you. And so the sample has to go to the machine and the machine might be across town or it may be in some other town. Now oftentimes how it works is that the samples are collected throughout the day and then shipped en masse to the machine wherever that might be. The second issue is that the machines can only do so many tests per day. So if the number of samples coming in to be analyzed is way more than the machine can get through, you'll begin to get a backlog, which is why in some places the result can take days to come back. It is not that the PCR is slow, it's just that the lab is badly backed up. Now this is a good time to mention the Abbott ID Now test because it was touted as the five minute test. So this test is not technically a PCR test, but uses another method of multiplying genetic material in a way that doesn't require a large machine. You can think of it as PCR 2.0. It's a relatively recent innovation in DNA or RNA analysis that's called loop-mediated isothermal amplification. The biggest advantage of LAMP technology isn't the speed, but its portability. A relatively small device that fits in your hands can be used to detect genetic material, and if enough of these machines are produced in scale, it can deliver testing capability to regions that don't have the larger, more expensive PCR machines close by. This is something that's called point-of-care testing, which is a term that we use in the medical world to refer to a test that doesn't have to be sent out somewhere else to be analyzed. LAMP machines can be housed in a regular doctor's office or even in pharmacies. The future of rapidly genetically based diagnostics is likely going to land in the arena of LAMP technology, but we haven't developed this as far as we have PCR technology, which has been around since the 1980s. Now, at the time of making this video, there are only two LAMP based manufacturers around, one of which is the Abbott one, which we just talked about, and the other is Attila Biosystems. Now, there is no doubt that there's going to be more of these being developed, though, in the months to come. Now, with respect to the Abbott machine, which got a fair amount of press when it was first introduced. We have something from Abbott Labs, which is right here, and that's a five-minute test, highly accurate, 
there have actually been real concerns about its accuracy. Now, a study out of New York University recently indicated that it missed about 20% of cases, and the FDA has since issued an alert about the performance of the test. Abbott Labs stated that they would continue to analyze the performance of the test going forward, but as of now, the consensus is that if the Abbott test is negative, and the patient has symptoms that are suggestive of COVID-19, then a PCR test should be done to follow up. Now, this brings us to the next question of testing accuracy. Overall, how accurate are these genetic tests, the PCR tests? Now, the answer to this is actually a little bit more complicated than you would think. Usually, when we talk about how accurate a test is, its accuracy is described with respect to another test that is considered to be a gold standard. For example, if I say that a certain test is 90% sensitive at detecting a disease, that is only because I'm comparing it to another more superior test that is capturing those additional 10% of cases that the first test is missing. Now, when it comes to viral PCR, we actually don't have a gold standard test that we're using to compare it to. Instead, what we do is that we give the PCR machine a manufactured sample of the virus, and then we see how accurate the machine is in detecting it. Now, the problem with this approach is that the artificially manufactured sample isn't the same thing as a human sample from an infected human, and the crossover isn't entirely perfect. Now, in order to test for the virus, a swab is inserted deep into the nose. But the swab has to get all the way up in there until it hits the upper part of the throat, called the nasopharynx, and once that is hit, the swab has to be trolled around three times in an attempt to sweep up as much material as we can. If the operator doesn't get deep enough, there is a good chance of not getting enough genetic material for the PCR to amplify. So the first potential point of failure is that the person administering the test isn't aggressive enough about putting that swab all the way up there and collecting enough virus. Now, this was actually demonstrated in a study from Canada that went back to examine PCR swabs that were negative in patients whom doctors suspected strongly of actually having COVID-19 despite having negative PCRs. Now, when these swabs were examined carefully, the researchers found that there was much less human DNA than they would have expected to see, suggesting that the collection of the material was suboptimal in the first place. Now, the second way that a PCR swab can render a false negative result is if the patient is being tested in the very early or the very late stages of infection. Now, this paper pulled together data from seven different studies and found that the chances of a false negative was 100% on the day of exposure, and by day four, when symptoms usually begin to appear, the false negative rate dropped down to 38%, which is still pretty high, actually. But by day 21, the false negative rate shot up again to 66%. Now, the narrative theory to explain why this might be occurring is that in the very early stages, there might not be enough of a viral burden in the nasopharynx for any detection to be possible. And this is why you hear about cases of patients who tested negative at first, only to test positive a few days later when the viral burden went up. Now, the same thing occurs presumably in the late stages of disease because the virus stops replicating in the nasopharynx, and we think anyway that at that stage it moves down into the lungs, although we're not really clear that that's what's happening, but that's the narrative explanation. Now, the third confounder is that the manufacturer quality of the tests is uncertain. Now, while PCR itself is a well-established technology, the fact remains that all of the PCR tests that we have on the market for SARS-CoV-2 were literally just invented and calibrated a few months ago. All of them have been released into the market under the so-called emergency use authorization guidelines by the FDA. And new tests from new manufacturers are entering the marketplace every single day. Now, the accuracy of these machines hasn't been tested and challenged with the same rigor that would occur under normal product development cycles. There could well be quality control issues with some of these tests that are coming out, as became apparent with the Abbott test. Now, having explained the central points of failure of the PCR tests, having said all that, the rule of thumb number that's been thrown around to clinicians these days about how sensitive the PCR tests are, that number is about 90%. Now, that still represents a fairly high failure rate. Now, I've actually seen this myself in clinical practice, where I recently took care of two patients in the hospital who had all of the symptoms of COVID-19, as well as x-ray findings consistent with COVID-19, and some additional blood work that we're starting to see in patients with COVID-19 as well. And yet these patients both had negative PCR results. For one of these patients, I actually had him tested twice, and even the second test came back negative. 
Nevertheless, because I strongly suspected both patients of having COVID-19, I still use the strict isolation precautions that we have in a hospital for patients like that. And when I discharged them from the hospital, I told both of them that they did have COVID-19 despite what the PCR said and advised both patients to quarantine themselves for two weeks once they were discharged from the hospital. Now, this highlights a very crucial and important point. See, we understand now that these PCR machines are not always going to catch the disease. So how do you interpret the results of a negative test when a patient has all of the symptoms of COVID-19? Well, when they have all of the classic signs, right? So that is a high-grade fever, loss of smell and taste, uh, coughing, shortness of breath, a headache, body aches. These are all now the classic signs that we're seeing of COVID-19. We're also seeing some blood test results that come back abnormal, such as elevated liver enzymes, such as something called CRP, which becomes really high, something called LDH, which becomes really high. If you throw that into the mix as well, then it doesn't matter what a PCR test comes back as. I'm not going to be convinced that this patient doesn't have COVID-19 in a pandemic-like situation where the cases keep on rising. What I'm not going to do is I'm not going to take that negative PCR and tell them that they don't have COVID-19. So we have to make sure that we're interpreting the results of these PCR tests in the context of the symptoms that the patient is being presented with. Now, maybe someone just has something that could be interpreted as allergies. Maybe they just have a sore throat. Those are not the classic symptoms of COVID-19 that we're starting to see in the hospital setting. And so in those cases, a negative PCR result might be meaningful. It might actually mean that they don't have the disease. But the more symptoms you have consistent with COVID-19, the less important the PCR becomes in ruling out the disease. I would still consider a patient with all of the symptoms of COVID-19 as being COVID-19 positive, despite what the PCR says. And this is a really important point that I have to drive home because a negative test, despite having all of these symptoms, does not rule out the disease at all. So this principle of knowing what to do with a negative result in the context of symptoms applies to all of the different kinds and uh, categories of testing for COVID-19. It's not specific to PCR. PCR actually is the most sensitive of all of the tests that we are going to be looking at. So that covers PCR tests, which really is the vast majority of all the testing that we've been doing. The key points to remember is that the turnaround time mostly depends on how backed up the labs are in returning the PCR samples through their system. Point of care testing like lamp technology is being rolled out and while the first iterations like the Abbott ID Now test have led to concerns about its sensitivity and accuracy, these tests should start to get better over time. Now we expect to see more of these kind of point of care tests rolling out in the future. The third thing to remember, and this is the most important thing, is that in a COVID-19 hotspot, symptoms that are consistent with COVID-19 carries far more weight in terms of the diagnosis than a negative test because PCR tests have a non-trivial error rate. Now, the last thing that I will say about the PCR test is that the FDA is describing these to the public as molecular tests, which is a needlessly confusing nomenclature to use because all of these tests use molecules. Now, let's go on to discuss the antibody tests. Uh, the principle behind the antibody tests are actually a lot more easy to understand. The idea is that once a person gets infected, they develop antibodies against the virus, and if we detect these antibodies in the blood, we can maybe draw some conclusions about maybe the patient got exposed to COVID in the past. Now, unlike the PCR tests, these are blood tests, they're not swab tests. Now, currently, I don't actually use antibody tests at all in my practice, and I don't routinely order them on any of my patients. And the reason is that I don't really understand the context in which antibody tests would be useful. What I mean is that if the patient comes to me with symptoms of COVID-19, as well as other blood abnormalities that are consistent with the disease, then that is all I really need to make the diagnosis and tell them to quarantine. I don't really even need a PCR, to be honest, because like I just explained, I wouldn't trust a negative PCR anyway in the face of classic COVID-19 symptoms. So in that situation, what would an antibody test contribute to the situation? So it's definitely never used as a diagnostic tool. Now, one can make the argument that we might want to use the antibody test on someone who's had symptoms, say, a month ago, and now we wanted to see if they had the disease. Now, at face value, this might seem to be a good reason to run the test, except there are some issues with this approach as well. Firstly, there is some cross-reactivity that's been reported with other coronaviruses. So a positive antibody test might not mean that you've been exposed to the SARS-CoV-2 virus, but you had some other coronavirus exposure sometime in the past. Now, the second thing that we've seen is that we don't entirely know how long the antibodies stay in the blood. 
So even if you've had COVID-19, if you've gotten better, it's very possible that by the time you got the antibody test, your antibodies were below a detectable level, and we wouldn't have been able to detect the antibodies at that time. Now, a Cochrane review on this subject was conducted recently, and it specifically looked into the question of whether or not antibody tests should be used to assess for past infections, especially when used in population surveys. Now, their conclusion was, the duration of antibody rises is currently unknown, and we found very little data beyond 35 days post-symptoms onset. We are therefore uncertain about the utility of these tests for seroprevalence surveys, for public health management purposes. So the long and short of it is that currently antibody tests have no role in making the diagnosis and they have an unclear role in population studies. There may be some role for them in the future, but what that is right now is not entirely clear. Now, the third and final category of test is the smallest category. It's very new, it's the antigen test. Now, an antigen is just a specific set of molecules that give rise to a immune response. So in the context of an antigen test for SARS-CoV-2, it simply refers to bits of viral particles. The antigen test attempts to detect these bits of viral particles, but unlike a PCR test, they do not amplify RNA or amplify anything else. They simply try to detect these small antigen bits of the virus directly. These tests are also swab tests. So the virus is first scraped out through the nose, the swab is then treated, and the resultant solution is then ran through a small device. Now, like the lamp test that we went over earlier, this antigen test is also a point of care test. Now again, Point of care testing does solve the problem of not needing those large expensive PCR machines, but the antigen tests that we have thus far, and we don't have very many of them, but the ones that we do have are well recognized as not being sensitive enough to rule out disease. So it's the same sort of thing that we have with the PCR. If an antigen test is negative and the patient has symptoms of COVID-19, you cannot rule out the disease. The next step in those kind of situations is to do a PCR, hoping that the PCR will capture the disease and then you will know for sure. That kind of covers everything you really need to know about the testing for COVID-19. Uh, again, the PCR stuff is the most sensitive, but even that is not fail safe. And if you have a patient with classic symptoms in a place where there's uh, an outbreak, uh, and that's many places these days, then a negative PCR does not rule out the disease. You still assume COVID-19. A PCR is useful in that case because it confirms a diagnosis if it's positive, and then you absolutely know for sure. So it at least clarifies it in some cases, but there are instances, and I've seen them myself, like I said, where the PCR test fails because the patient obviously has clinical symptoms that are consistent with COVID-19. So that's, I think, one of the biggest takeaways you should take away regarding the PCR test. The same principle applies to the antigen and the antibody tests as well. So to a large extent, that I think covers most of the questions most people I expect would have about the COVID testing. It is a uh, complex subject. It's getting more complicated as more kind of tests are being rolled out. If you have any questions on anything that I've discussed over here, please put that down in the comment section. I will get back to you if I have time. Uh, thank you so much for watching and I will see you all in the next video.